Hi and welcome back to the Open Tech Lab. So in today's video I'm going to be talking all about USB, the humble communication protocol that we use to connect all of our devices to our laptops and it's quite interesting, it's got a few different layers to it and I'll try and explain some things about it. And specifically I'm going to be focusing on this little rig I have here, some of you may have seen it before if you've uh, seen my video about 3D printed mounts and the mount that I made for uh, this little development rig. And this is something I've been working on as part of my day job. And what this consists of is a PC motherboard, an Intel NUC board on the left here, and a little USB peripheral board that has an STM32. And the two are connected together by uh, this ribbon cable that links the two, and they communicate with each other using uh, USB full speed. Now, the uh, microcontroller on this little board is an STM32F0, and I was given the task of developing the firmware for this thing, and it turned out to uh, uh, have a few different pitfalls that I ran into, uh, but also there are a few ways in which I was able to uh, learn quite a lot about what was going on between the device and the PC by using SIGROC. Now, I've spoken quite a lot about SIGROC and logic analyzers, and this is going to be another video where I focus on some of the amazing features that SIGROC has, because using SIGROC I was able to capture the packet flow that was going back and forth uh, between uh, the PC and the peripheral board here, uh, which really uh, dug me out of a hole that uh, I would have been scratching my head out uh, for a very long time if I hadn't had that tool available to use. So I'm really excited to go through all this. I think it's going to be quite interesting, and there's quite a lot to get through, so let's get started. So at the heart of this project is this little peripheral board, and at the heart of the peripheral board is this STM32F042 microcontroller. And this is a little ARM-based microcontroller. It has a Cortex-M0 core, which is its processor built in, and it has a few different peripherals. It has 32 kilobytes of flash, and it has a USB slave controller, which is how it connects up to the PC. And the function of this board is quite simple. It's got a couple of relays for controlling some outputs. It's got a couple of opto isolators for receiving some inputs. And it can also communicate with a couple of channels of RS-485 signaling. And that's about all there is to this thing. So this is my development setup and you can see in the middle I've got the board and then it's plugged up to my development PC through this cable going off to the right. And then at the back I've also got a USB hub and into that is plugged the DS Logic Plus Logic Analyzer and that's what I'm going to be using to snoop on the various signals coming out of this board. And then I've also got this Chinese clone ST-Link, which is a USB debugger. And th this can be used to load firmware into the microcontroller, and it can also be used uh, for single-stepping through the code and doing things like that. So if we take a closer look at this thing, you can see that I've had to make a fair few modifications to attach the various things that I need to this board. And in general, uh, if you're setting up these development boards, it's well worth taking the time to make sure that what you've got has a reasonable degree of of mechanical stability because otherwise things just get broken and drop off and then you can end up spending your whole time chasing ghosts which are actually caused by your wires dropping off and that's a lot that's a big waste of time so what I've got here is um, a 0.1 inch header on the side over here and I've got this uh, super glued down to the board and then uh, to the pins on it it's attached off to the various debug pins on the microcontroller and I've also got a pin here which is um, a digital output uh, which I can also use just for sending uh, general signals uh, off to the logic analyzer and then on the right here I've got a Molex header um, uh, that I'm using to plug in the, the USB cable and this has been mod wired up to the uh, pins over here and I've got a little loop on the right uh, attached to the ground plane, a nice easy uh, point to attach an oscilloscope or a logic analyzer uh, ground connections to. And I've also got another little loop just here um, for the same purpose. And then uh, in addition to this, there are a couple of other digital output pins that I've got in the middle here. Uh, these are just the little bits of um, 
uh, copper wire that I've attached to a couple of spare pins that are on this uh, unpopulated footprint. Then to attach the logic analyzer to the USB, I've attached a couple of pins of a pin header here, and this is a nice stable thing that I can clip the hook probes onto. So now with this whole setup in place, we're in a position to start capturing some USB packets. So here we are in Sigrock Pulse View, and as you can see, we're connected up to the DS Logic Logic Analyzer, and I've got it configured to collect a half million samples at 50 mega samples per second, which means that the capture length is 10 milliseconds. Now, the reason for the 50 mega samples per second sample rate is that we're capturing uh, USB signaling uh, and it's communicating in USB full speed, uh, which is uh, sent at 10 megabits per second. And because this is the bit rate, uh, the Nyquist criterion requires us to sample at at least 20 mega samples per second. And when you're capturing with logic analyzers, it's typically advisable to oversample by two times or more, which would take us up to 40 mega samples per second. And so I've set it to 50 mega samples per second because that's the, uh, the nearest option in the list. And it seems like a good choice and it works well. So here in this capture, you can see there is a series of packets and these are all being sent by the PC, but no actual data is being transferred. Uh, so these are the packets that the PC sends when uh, the USB bus is in the idle state. And if we zoom in on one of these packets, uh, you can see the individual bits that it's made out of. And if we zoom in even closer, you can see the individual samples. And you can see that each of these bits has roughly uh, five samples in it, uh, although it varies because of timing differences between uh, the logic analyzer and the USB bus timing itself. Now, in many ways, USB resembles a differential signaling system uh, similar to CAN bus and Ethernet. And you can see here that we have two data lines that we're capturing from, uh, D minus and D plus. And you can see that uh, the two signals being sent are uh, mostly a mirror image of each other. But what separates USB from a truly differential system is that sometimes in some states it will send a pulse on one of the lines but not on the other. So you can see at the end of this packet that the PC is sending here, it puts a negative pulse on the D plus line uh, right at the end of the packet and this pulse doesn't have a mirror image in the D minus line. And this is what sets USB apart from a tr truly differential system. And in fact, what we have here is really a, a, a two-channel single-ended system, uh, which is why we can capture these packets off the wire with a single-ended logic analyzer like the DS Logic. And we don't have to have a setup uh, involving any current transformers or differential probing or anything like that that will be necessary to uh, read the bits off the wire in a current-driven system such as Ethernet. So now we've got packets of data captured, we can use Sigrox decoding features to decode the meaning of the pulses. So I'm going to go into the decoders menu and select USB signaling. And you can see that uh, since I added the decoder, it's automatically associated the inputs to the decoder with the, the two data lines because the names match the inputs, which works out very nicely. And you can see what this uh, decoder is doing is it's decoding the zeros and ones off the wire. Now, um, the USB uses a, a non-return zero inverting NRZI line coding, and it also uses a kind of bit stuffing to make sure that uh, there never is a long run of zeros or ones in a row. And uh, so the USB signaling decoder uh, decodes these pulses into the actual uh, symbols that are being transmitted down the wire. So the next level uh, of decoding we can add is uh, if we go into the uh, menu here and select stack decoder, uh, we can add the USB packet decoder. And this decodes the meanings of these symbols and decodes the actual uh, fields within the packet. And you can see uh, the opening section of this packet is a sync word, uh, followed by an ID for the meaning of the packet and a frame number and a five bit uh, CRC checksum at the end. And then there's just a little bit of a, 
end of packet lead out here. So what you can see overall here is that we have an SOF packet, which means start of frame. And uh, what we have in the overall capture is a series of these SOF start of frame packets that are spaced out exactly one millisecond apart. And uh, what this is saying, the PC is saying that it's got no message in each of these SOF packets, no message for the device, and it's an opportunity for the device to, uh, once it's received this, it, perhaps if it has something to say to the PC, then it can then start up a message transfer if it has anything to say back to the PC, which in this example it doesn't because, of course, the bus is idle. So one of the things to take away from this is that USB is very, very timing sensitive, uh, which is why a hardware controller is necessary uh, in order to handle the uh, real time aspect of the low level USB communication. Now, the chip that we're using has a structure very similar to pretty much any microcontroller you're likely to encounter. So at the heart of this chip, we have a processor uh, where the software runs, and in this case, it is an ARM Cortex-M0, and then it controls various peripherals uh, around the outside of this device through a series of internal buses. And for the most part, the peripherals are designed to implement various forms of communication so that the chip can uh, tell other chips what to do and and communicate with other aspects of the product. So here I have the block diagram of the USB controller and uh, the job of this block is to take care of every aspect of the USB communication that can't feasibly be handled in software. And so there's a few different things in this block and you can see at the top the two USB data lines coming in, D plus and D minus. And the first thing they're connected up to is this USB phi. And a FI's job is to take care of receiving the bits in and uh, reading them off the wire. And it also contains the hardware necessary to drive signals onto the wire when transmitting. And then in the middle here we have this block and uh, this has a variety of functions. Uh, mainly it's to do with the real-time aspects of the communication. Uh, you can't just speak uh, packets onto a USB bus willy-nilly. It has to be initiated by the PC and uh, the timing requirements are quite strict for that. So this little block in olive color takes care of that and it also takes care of the flow control so if the PC wants to send a message but the chip isn't ready to receive it it can tell the PC automatically to go away for a while and equally the PC might uh, want to ask if the chip has something to send and it can take care of telling the PC whether there's anything uh, that the chip is ready to send or receive and if there are packets ready to send or receive uh, they're transferred into the buffer memory and uh, they can also be transferred back out of the buffer memory and then this uh, packet buffer memory is accessible uh, from the processor core over the APB bus which is just the internal bus uh, that is used within the uh, STM32F0 to uh, transfer data in and out of memory. And then we just have a few registers over here and their function is just to configure the whole uh, USB core to do what it's meant to do. Now the firmware is built with the C programming language and it uses libopencm3 and libopencm3 is a really nice library of functions that make it easy to program a whole series of different microcontrollers by many different manufacturers and all of these different microcontrollers are focused around the ARM Cortex cores uh, which is the case for the STM32 that we're using and what this library basically offers to us is a couple of things firstly it makes it much much easier to program the various peripherals on the chip so normally you have to write certain values into various registers in order to make the peripheral behave as you want it to and this just wraps all that up into a nice API a nice interface of functions that you can call from your software so you don't have to focus so much on the low level programming and it also offers a communication stack particularly for USB and uh, there's quite a lot more to USB communication than the hardware itself can handle um, and you don't want to get bogged down in having to write your own USB stack so libopencm3 has a built-in USB stack that you can use uh, so your application just can just focus on what you need to solve rather than having to deal with all the complexities of uh, conforming to the USB specification properly. So now I want to move towards capturing a real conversation off the USB bus and to do that I'm going to need some test firmware 
and this is the program I have. It's less than 300 lines of C code, and most of it's taken up with these static buffers that are here, and they declare various in bits of information uh, about the device that is sent up to the PC when it first connects, and that includes its capabilities. And so the buffers here are declaring that the device claims to support a virtual serial port, and that it also has a built-in DFU interface, which is device firmware upgrade, which means that the firmware can be upgraded over USB. So these are just here as a sort of dummy uh, set of interfaces to send to the PC. And then if I scroll down to the bottom here, we've got the main function, and this gets invoked when the uh, chip first powers on and runs for the whole lifetime uh, while the microcontroller is running. And the first thing we do is set up some clocks, and then we initialize the USB stack here and then we set up some GPIOs and these are used for sending debugging signals to the logic analyzer and we'll be using those in a minute and uh, in the middle here we have this loop uh, this is the main loop and all that it's doing right now is just running the USB stack through this USBD pole function and then I've got a couple of these GPIOs so that we get an output uh, that's set while USBD pole is running and then cleared so that we'll be able to see the timing uh, of this loop. So we'll be able to see how much time is being taken uh, by this function as it runs, as packets are sent and received. So it's pretty simple. And then the only other thing that I've implemented here is this uh, callback. So I've registered a callback, uh, the vendor control callback uh, in here. Um, and this basically says that uh, this function will be invoked any time the PC sends a vendor message, which is basically a custom product-specific message. And we're not going to do anything with the data of the message from the PC. We're just going to toggle one of the other uh, output lines so that we can see in the logic analyzer when the PC message was received by the microcontroller. Now on the PC side we need some software that we can use to send the messages to the firmware and here I've got a really simple program written in Python and it uses the Pi USB library and uh, I really like this way of working, it makes it really quick and easy when you're prototyping to send some custom messages to the device. So what I have here is a couple of lines of code uh, to locate the device by its vendor ID and product ID and open it up so we can talk to it and then we have a line here that initiates a control transfer to the device it sets the BM request to Xerox 40 uh, which means that it's an outgoing request that it's a vendor specific custom request and it applies to the whole device uh, the request number is one uh, so if you had multiple different types of function that you can invoke in the device the, this number would vary uh, then we've got a couple of arguments that we can pass in that request and also a payload of data that goes along with the request as well so these numbers here uh, are not going to be uh, handled by the firmware at all it will just ignore them but having these here will be useful because we'll be able to see them when we read the communication off the wire so now all the software is taken care of we're in a position to start capturing some packets off the bus and so we're here once again inside pulse view and i've lined up a terminal window behind which i will use to invoke the python script but before we do that, I want to do one more capture with the bus in the idle state. And you can see the SOF packets once again on the D- and D- lines. And if we zoom in on this, you can also see that now we've got a pulsing on channel 5. And you might remember the reason for that is that I'm setting uh, the output high during the period while the USB D pole function is running. And so the repeating waveform we're seeing here, one cycle of this waveform indicates one cycle of the main loop. And between the rising and falling edge of this waveform is the period of time while the, while the libopencm3 USB stack is executing one iteration. And in this case, because all we're getting is start of frame packets, these are being uh, silently dismissed by the hardware and soft, the software never has to deal with these at all, which is why the period of this uh, waveform is completely regular because in every case the loop is doing exactly no work and returning quite, quite quickly.
So now let's go ahead and capture some real packets. And to do that, I've set the logic analyzer to trigger off the rising edge of a pulse on logic analyzer channel number three, which is wired up to the pin PB6 on our microcontroller. And you might remember that this is set up within the firmware uh, to send a pulse out when the uh, vendor control message callback is invoked within the firmware. So we're going to get a little notification when the firmware thinks it received a packet from the PC. So I've set the logic analyzer to have a 50% pre-trigger capture ratio. So hopefully we're going to see our event right in the middle of the sweep. So now if I go ahead and click run, and this will set the logic analyzer to wait for our trigger event. So now I can run our script, uh, which is control test.py. Uh, if I go ahead and run that, let's see if we capture something. There we go, uh, we have a nice sweep there, and you can see right in the middle of the sweep we have a little pulse uh, on PB6, and that's the firmware uh, showing that callback got invoked. And uh, you can see there's a few different stages to this, uh, this communication here, uh, and also you can see that while some messages were being uh, received by the microcontroller, the duty cycle of this waveform changes because now the USB D poll function has a little bit more to deal with uh, now that some messages are being received. So the whole transaction we have here is taking about 63 microseconds to complete. So to interpret the meaning of the waveforms, let's add uh, some decoders. So I've got the USB signaling decoder and I'm gonna stack on top of that the USB packet decoder. And on top of that, I'm going to stack the USB request decoder. So three decoders stacked up on top of each other. And you can see the USB request decoder has given us one big blob that indicates the whole structure of the transaction and it shows us the headers of the control message that we sent. You can see the cafe dude from the W value and W index, although the endianness has changed a bit. And uh, you can see the request number here and the 40 request type from the Python script. And you can see the contents of the payload uh, that we set up over here. And then we can see the response from the microcontroller, which is an ACK saying that it accepted this control request. But to really understand what's going on here, let's zoom in on the individual stages of the transfer. And it's divided up into a few different stages. So first of all, what happens is that the PC says to the microcontroller, I want to set up a transfer uh, of uh, a control message to endpoint zero. And then it goes ahead and the PC transfers to the microcontroller the headers. And you can see the uh, various arguments, the control message here, to which the microcontroller says ACK, which means it's acknowledged and accepted the header. And then the PC follows up by saying uh, that it's going, it wants to set up the transfer of the payload and then it goes ahead and transfers the payload bytes here and after those have been transferred once more the microcontroller says ACK again and it's happy to, re that it's happy to have received those bytes. And then uh, the PC goes straight ahead and starts trying to set up an inbound transaction and the reason it's doing this is it's trying to get the microcontroller to respond uh, with a return value from the vendor control message, uh, whatever response the microcontroller wants to send back. And the microcontroller isn't ready to send that back, so it sends back NAC, not acknowledged. And so the PC goes away for a little while, and in the meantime, uh, we get our vendor control callback, uh, it gets invoked, and it takes a little while because, of course, our microcontroller isn't ever so fast and the PC is a little bit quick. Uh, so the microcontroller needs to deal with this re uh, response. And here's our handler getting called within the firmware. And at just about the same time, the PC tries once more. Have you got a response for me? And the microcontroller says knack. And that's because uh, with the timing of this, even though our vendor... Uh, control callback has got invoked here, uh, the response still isn't quite ready to send back to the PC. And so here we get <laughs> uh, one more invocation of USB D poll, and this time the PC asks for a third time, have you got a response for me? And the uh, microcontroller says, yes, I have. Uh, so it sends back an ACK rather than a NAC. And this time it's saying, 
uh, because there's this middle stage in the middle here, the microcontroller is saying uh, that it hasn't got anything to s send back. Rather, it's sending a packet that uh, is an OK, but it contains zero payload bytes. And then that's the end of the transaction. So there's uh, certainly a little bit of a dance going on, quite a lot of handshaking going on between the device and the PC. But all this happens quite quickly. It's done within a few microseconds. And so that is how control messages are sent into USB devices. Now, for more information about the structure of various types of USB transfer, there's a whole chapter about it in Chapter 4 of the USB in a Nutshell Guide at beyondlogic.com. And you can see they've got a few nice diagrams showing essentially what we just saw read off the wire and then more information about the structure of various other types of transfer uh, such as interrupt transfers and isochronous and bulk transfers and so on. And there's a whole load more information that is really helpful for getting started developing USB peripherals. Now, in one of my previous videos, I did a segment about how to do packet capture with Linux's USB Mon feature, which allows you to capture the packets that are being sent and received from the PC. Now, it's worth asking the question, what is the benefit of using a logic analyzer to snoop on the uh, USB traffic versus just logging it in the PC? And there's a few answers. The first is that it allows you to see a lot more low level and real time detail. And we can see a lot of the invisible protocol that is silently handled by the uh, hardware of the host controller and the peripherals internal USB controller. For example, those setups that we saw uh, where the hardware responded with NAC packets, uh, that's not something we would ever see in USB Mon because the, the hardware would uh, handle that silently without the kernel ever having to get involved and without the kernel being able to make a log of it. And also on top of that, if there is any kind of protocol violation, any kind of corrupt packets going along the wire, that's not something we're going to see in USB Mon either because those will be discarded by uh, the low level hardware also. And another benefit of using a logic analyzer is that it allows us to do the side by side comparison uh, with various real time debug signals, uh, pulses that we set on those output lines as we had in that previous demo. And that's a really, really powerful thing. And it's quite necessary to debug certain kinds of real time issues. So overall, having a logic analyzer gives us a lot of uh, more low level information that we're not going to see uh, with PC based logging. But on the other hand, it's a lot harder to set up and USB Mon for the most part gives us everything we need. So most of the time I find myself using USB Mon, uh, but the logic analyzer is a good tool to have ready if I'm doing something a little bit more tricky. So now let's talk about the scenario that prompted all of this. And the story behind this issue is that I was developing the firmware for the microcontroller and I'd got pretty much towards the end of adding all the functionality into the software that needed to be there. And I was testing the control messages that was being sent into the device. And I found this very rare, very sporadic issue uh, that would sometimes occur. And so to demonstrate the problem, I've modified the control test script uh, to not just send a single message to the device, uh, but instead to send a whole series of messages as fast as possible and to check that each one is processed correctly. So let's go ahead and run the script and see what happens. So there's a brief delay and uh, messages are going through. There we go. And here we have an error. And the error we're getting is a pipe error, uh, which is a generic catch-all error message from the kernel saying that there was some kind of communication issue over USB. And thereafter, the device just becomes completely inoperable and you can't send any messages to it. So to help explain the scenario in a bit more detail, I've drawn this diagram. So of course, we've got the microcontroller on the left and we've got the PC on the right. And then, of course, the prime mover in all this is the USB host controller. And that is directed what to do by the Linux kernel. And then in user space, we have our Python script, which uses the Pi USB library, which in turn uses libUSB uh, to tell the kernel to send messages through to our device. And then, of course, we have our firmware, which is built on top of libopencm3. And that's used to send and receive messages from the slave controller. 
Now, the problem we have here is that we have so little visibility on what is actually going wrong. So we know for one thing that the PC is putting the bus in the stall state, and it does that when there is any kind of miscommunication or error on the bus. And at that point, the uh, as far as the PC is concerned, the device is not talking sense anymore, and so it just gives up uh, uh, trying to have a conversation with it. It just says, this device is done, and it doesn't try and send through any more messages until the user comes and unplugs it and plugs it back in again. And so uh, we don't know much about what went wrong, uh, because all the software uh, in the PC knows is that there was some error. And so with USB Mon, if we try to log the packets, uh, all you see is an error in response to the last control message that we try and send, and no detail about what the error was. And uh, perhaps the host controller knows, but it's pretty much impossible to get many, uh, any information out of this. Um, so we don't know much about what the miscommunication was on the wire. And furthermore, we don't know what state any of this got into, uh, the microcontroller got into that caused this. So it could be a problem with our firmware. It could be a problem with libopencm3. It could even be a problem with the silicon hardware of the slave controller, although it's quite unlikely for this processor because uh, it's been used quite extensively. So it's unlikely that there are unknown erratas inside uh, the behavior of the USB slave controller in the STM32, but it could happen. You can never completely rule these things out. And we just have no idea um, of what state this thing is in when the error occurs. So we have a real just fog over everything. We can't see what's going wrong. And so we're in trouble because we can't uh, really ask for help in any way because uh, if we were to just start posting questions in forums, it's not as if we have uh, any information to help someone uh, analyze what's going wrong in the setup. So we're pretty much stuck. So given that the firmware for the microcontroller was at quite a late stage of development, uh, there was certainly quite a bit of complexity in play, which can be a real problem in bare metal applications because there's little protection to prevent one part of your application from causing uh, chaos in another part if it decides to malfunction. So if one aspect of your firmware decides to start going bonkers and writing into random memory addresses, uh, you'll just see some really hard to understand corrupted memory or you could have some issues with interrupts or whatever it may be. So it's very, very hard to uh, understand what's going wrong if you have no clue and you have a complex application. And this pseudocode I have here kind of indicates uh, uh, how the overall thing looked at this point. So as we saw in the demo, we had some setup functions at the top, and then we have a main loop uh, which runs forever, and inside that we have the USBD poll function, and then when USB is all set up, we also have some additional, additional functionality which runs, taking care of all the rest of the functions of the uh, software. So uh, the first thing I started to do was start to eliminate these functions. And as I did that, I found that uh, little by little, the problem seemed to become less and less uh, likely to occur. And at first I thought that it was specific to one of these functions uh, causing the issue. But in the end, I found that it, no matter what order I removed them from the firmware, uh, as I got down and uh, removed all of them or almost all of them, eventually the problem would slowly disappear. And uh, this gives us a little hint and it suggests to us that it's timing related. And to confirm that theory, I just removed all of this uh, code from the firmware altogether and replaced it with a, a little delay, uh, which would just waste a period of time. And indeed, I found that if the delay loop was set to a short period, uh, then there will be no error. And if I had it set to a really long period, then the error would happen instantly every time. And if I had it set somewhere between the two, uh, then it would occur uh, somewhat sporadically. So this is really, really weird because uh, even though we've got none of our own code in here, we do have USBD poll, 
uh, uh, being called. And of course, uh, USBD poll needs to be called somewhat regularly to make sure messages are sent and received from the USB slave controller. Uh, but if there's some delay, it really shouldn't matter at all uh, because of USB's flow control. So the slave controller takes care of telling the PC to wait if the buffers inside the slave controller are full. So even if the firmware is super slow in uh, getting back to uh, calling this USBD poll function, it really, really shouldn't matter uh, because the PC will just wait until the uh, uh, the the hard uh, the microcontroller is ready to receive more messages. But yet it does seem to matter. If the delay is too long, then uh, the protocol uh, breaks. And so the question is, why is that? There must be something odd happening inside USBD poll uh, because at this point I've li eliminated all of my own code. The only active element left is libopencm3 code. The problem is that there's a lot of code inside this function and a lot of code that I personally am not familiar with. So it's a real needle in a haystack situation to figure out what state this USBD poll function is getting into. Now, fortunately, because libopencm3 is open source software, and of course we love open source software on the Open Tech Lab channel, uh, we get to have a look inside the code. And so here I am in the stusbfs poll function, which is the uh, implementation of USB-D poll on this particular microcontroller. And there's a fair bit going on in here. Uh, there's a little bit of code and this code then calls through to a whole bunch of other function pointers and callbacks that get invoked in various ways. And there's certainly quite a lot of uh, functionality here and it's not at all obvious what's going wrong. So it was at this point that I first decided to see if I could use SIGROC to capture the signals off the bus and I figured that it might give me some kind of a clue. But to make things more difficult, the only fast logic analyzer that I had access to at the time was this OpenBench logic sniffer. And as you can see, the OpenBench logic sniffer is a bareboard logic analyzer. It doesn't come in an enclosure. And it's certainly quite a bit less powerful than the DS logic that I'm using in today's demo. And its main limitation is that it doesn't have any streaming capabilities. It, only, it can only capture samples into internal RAM. And that RAM is quite limited in size. It can only capture just over 6,000 samples. And therefore, if we're capturing at high speed, uh, the window that we're going to get visibility on uh, the traffic going on the wire is a really, really short period of time, which means that we have to trigger the capture very, very close to the moment of the failure. Now, I had to scratch my head about this for a minute, but uh, I came up with a solution that turned out to work extremely nicely. So it's easy enough to trigger a logic analyzer with our development board because of course we've got plenty of output lines that we can use as trigger signals to the logic analyzer. But the problem is that we don't know what state the microcontroller is getting into when the error occurs. And so we can't generate that signal and trigger it with this board. We have to trigger it with the PC somehow because only the PC knows when the error occurs which is a little bit more difficult. Now I could have just relocated my setup to some kind of PC with easily accessible output lines to wiggle. For example, a Raspberry Pi would have served okay. Uh, but I decided to do something quick and ugly uh, with one of these USB serial modules. And this is just like a normal serial port that you can plug into USB. But the main difference is that the output voltage is at TTL levels. So between zero and 3.3 .3 volts rather than the normal plus minus 12 12 volt swing that you get with RS232. And these modules are really cheap. You can pick them up for about $1.50 from Banggood and places like that. And if you flip it over, you can see it's got the pin, uh, pin markings on the back. And the key thing here is that we can use this module and when we want to trigger the logic analyzer, all we have to do is uh, just tell this little thing to emit a character uh, and that character will involve a series of pulses sent down the TXD line here. And uh, when we send that, we, uh, we can set the logic analyzer to trigger off the edges that go into that. Now, there are some risks with this because, of course, uh, there are certain delays involved in getting the PC to send a character through to this device. So might not have worked, but uh, I found that in practice it worked all right. So now I've got the serial device plugged into the logic analyzer, let's see if we can use it to trigger some packet capture. <laughs> 
Okay, so here I am sitting inside Tmux and you can see I've got some kind of epic split screen setup and then I've got pulse view overlaid in the corner. So to begin with, let's have a look at the source code of the firmware. Uh, so I'm going to open up the main.c here and if I scroll down to the bottom uh, you can see the main function and we've got our setup uh, stuff at the top and then we've got our main loop just as we have had in the pseudocode and you can see this time we've got this delay function here which is just counting up to, uh, to a period uh, defined by this constant and at the moment the delay period is set to be relatively short and this value is below the threshold where the error kicks in so now if I run make, we can go ahead and build the firmware. There we go. And you can see if we look here, it's spat out this dio.fw firmware. And this is the file we need to load into the device. OK, so now I want to load this firmware into the microcontroller. But first, I'm going to need to watch the kernel log because uh, this is going to be helpful so that we can see when the kernel detects the appearance and disappearance of the demo board. And so by running dmessage-w, we can watch the uh, messages that the kernel makes as they arrive. So now I want to install the firmware. And to do that, I'm going to be using the stlink debugger. And to take control of that, I'm going to be using openocd. So if I paste this command in here, you can see uh, there are a couple of config files that get fed in on the command line and these just define the profile of the device and the stlink debugger and I don't want to go into too much into detail about OpenOCD right now but when I run this uh, it's going to uh, start up a couple of network servers connected to the local network interface and so we can control OCD by connecting to those through Telnet so let me run OpenOCD here and this is now sitting in the background waiting uh, for commands and then I can connect to the uh, uh, the local server with this command on port 444 okay and here we've got a prompt so the first thing I want to do is reset the device uh, the demo board and put it into halt mode so it's re uh, resets it and causes it to freeze and you can see that the kernel is reporting uh, that the device is disconnected so now I want to install the firmware and to do that I'm going to run this command and this just writes an image into the flash within the device after erasing it. Uh, we put in the path to our firmware file and specify the start address where we want to write it to and this uh, 08000000 is the address that the flash starts in the uh, uh, memory structure of the STM32. So let's go ahead and do that and it takes a second or so and there we go the firmware is installed. So now the device is still in the frozen state, uh, in the reset state. So now if I run reset once more but without the halt argument this time uh, we'll reset it and uh, reset it into the running state. There we go and you can see our device has connected and been registered by the kernel and you can see the kernel is saying there is a new ACM device, which is basically uh, the kernel reporting that it detected the virtual serial port capability that the firmware claims to have. So now here I am sitting inside the control test Python script. And again, it's just set up to do a single transfer. There's no repetition set up or anything like that, like we just had now. And then if we have a look at pulse view, you can see that we've got all the channel inputs set up. We've got our trigger channel set here. Uh, this is connected to that USB serial device and it's what we'll be using to trigger the capture. And so it's set up to trigger on a falling edge. And then I've set up the pre-trigger capture ratio to 90%, uh, which means that 90% of our 5 million samples will be uh, captured before the trigger point. So now let's click run, uh, which will put uh, Sigrock in the state where it's waiting for a trigger event. And now we can go ahead and run our first test. So to do that, I'm going to run the control test script. And after that runs, straight after, we're going to echo a single character in the TTY USB zero device. So now let's go ahead and run that. There we are. And you can see we've got a capture in pulse view and this returned with no error. So this shows that with that short delay in the firmware, uh, everything's working just fine. So let's zoom in on this. And what you can see is um, 
a series of command packets and commands that are identical to the ones we saw earlier uh, because of course all is going well at the moment. Okay so now I'm going to modify the firmware and set the delay to 128 loops of my little not loop here and I found previously that with this value uh, this is enough of a delay to trigger the error to kick in. So I'm going to go ahead and quit, build the firmware, there we go and I will halt the device flash it and reset it and it's connected up to the kernel again okay let's trigger pulse view ready to capture the trigger and then let's run our control test once again and let's go there we go and we've got a capture and also you can see that we've got a pipe error this time so this is the uh, error coming out of python with our miscommunication so let's have a look at the USB packets that we've got and you can see at the start here um, the PC does a setup uh, so it wants to set up an outgoing uh, message going out to the device and it sends the uh, arguments of the control message here and it doesn't get any response at all uh, from the device so it tries again and sends the same setup and the same data and it gets no response once more and it tries one more time and then it just gives up on the control message and thereupon we get our pipe error on the PC and then a few milliseconds later uh, just down here we get our trigger uh, the character coming out of our uh, USB serial device. So now we know what's going wrong. The microcontroller is giving no reply to the PC when it attempts to set up the control message transfer, just silence. And the PC tries three times and after that it just gives up. And indeed our vendor control callback is never invoked. And so now we know what's going wrong. We need to try and figure out what state the firmware is getting into that would cause all this. So to figure out what's going on, we're going to use some of those trace output pulses to try and figure out where the flow of execution is actually going. So here I am in the vendor control callback, and of course this is never getting invoked because things are going so badly. So there's no sense in taking up one of my debug pulses, uh, debug GPIOs in here, because uh, we know it's not going to get invoked. So we can take this one out, and I'm going to move it somewhere else. I'm going to move it to... This function here, stusbfs poll, we saw it earlier, it's the innards of usbd poll, the USB stack. And looking through the code of this thing, uh, I'm not too suspicious of most of this apart from this block here, uh, which is the block that gets triggered when messages are received uh, inside the USB slave block. So I think it's worth putting our GPIO uh, P PB6 uh, wrapping that around this little if statement here be interesting to see and uh, then of course we've got one more GPIO available to play with and I'm very interested in this little line here uh, which is the only function invocation inside this block so I'm going to wrap it around here except the GPIO number is GPIO 7 and uh, we need to set and then clear and one more thing, we need to add a uh, missing header on the top because this code doesn't normally manipulate GPIOs. Okay, save and quit, build. There we go, built correctly, halt the device, flash the firmware, restart the device. Prepare pulse view, waiting for the trigger, and then run our test case. Bang. There we go. So what have we got in here? So I've reordered the signals to make it a bit easier to see how this fits together, and I've updated the labels to correspond to the code that these pulses are wrapped around. And at the bottom we have USB D pole, just as we had at the start. Uh, we've got the wrap around that if block, 
and you can see there's a significant period of delay and that's because it's always entering into the body of that if block every single time uh, because it's thinking there's some kind of received message every single time which is very very interesting and then within that every single time it's also going into that user callback function there so it's interesting that every single USB-D pole is always taking the same flow even before the PC tries to set up start uh, sending our message which suggests that uh, way back before we even trigger the capture way back before the PC tries to send it a message uh, the device is already blocked up with some message that it's received and it's just every time thinking it's received something and uh, for whatever reason, there's some kind of message stuck inside the USB slave controller, I would say. Now, to try and figure out what's really going on here, let's move our GPIOs a bit closer in and see where the code flow's going. Now, as I was searching this through, I found it particularly helpful to have three debug signals, orange, yellow, and green, because that way, on each test run, I could change the code location of one of these signals while keeping the other two the same. And I think with less than three, it's a lot easier to get into a position where you think you see a pattern, but actually you're chasing ghosts because the software is not actually running the same way from one execution to the next. Whereas with three signals, because you're only changing one of them and two remain the same, it's a lot easier to just visually maintain confidence that something strange isn't happening that you didn't expect. And if you can have more than three, that's even better, of course. So to prevent this from getting too tedious, I've already done the trial and error searching and I've been drilling down into the user callback CTR function call and uh, it has resolved into this function, uh, the USBD control out function, which basically is the state machine for handling the data transfer stage of these messages, uh, the outgoing data from the PC. So I've wrapped the whole function uh, with GPIO 7 and then uh, the state that is actually problematic is this error state, the default case handler, uh, which causes a call to stall transaction. So what's actually going on here is that um, it, we're typically going to be halfway through the transfer of a packet and uh, the PC will either say, here's some data, or this is the last data you're going to get, or this is the status of a transfer you sent up to the PC, Mr. Microcontroller. And if it's not one of those things, then the state machine's now in a really confused state because it thinks it should be transferring some data uh, when, in fact, that's not what's going on. So something very weird is going on here. And you can see in pulse view, uh, every single loop, we're getting all the way through to that stall transaction thing. So obviously the problem, uh, the thing that causes this, ha it has happened a long time uh, before we ever try and send a message to it with Python USB. So the next thing to do is to try and figure out when this stall transaction actually begins. And so usefully we can just set this up as a trigger instead of the USB serial device from the PC. We can just trigger off the first time this, fa this failure ever occurs after reset. So to capture this event, I've put the device into the halted state and I've got pulse view waiting for a trigger on the first time that stall transaction action ever happens so let's reset the device there we go now let's have a look at what we've got so looking at this trace you can see there's quite a flurry of USB activity and this is what happens when a USB device first comes out of reset and what's going on here is that when the device first connects to the USB bus, uh, the PC will send it a whole load of queries to retrieve all the metadata contained within the device. And that contains the device description and all of its interface descriptors and so on. Everything the PC needs to know about the device itself. And so our error seems to be kicking in some way through this process. And I've done a few uh, uh, different runs to confirm this. And it always seems to happen when we have a setup out transaction here. 
and then uh, the transaction is immediately followed by a setup in transaction. Uh, and you might remember we were in the outgoing event handler. So the, con the, the state machine thinks it's dealing with this little group of messages here, but then it gets really confused for, because for whatever reason, uh, it's, it's not really expecting to get an incoming packet here. Although the PC is uh, sending completely legitimate messages, it's just that the state machine has got confused. So having collected all these details, I had plenty of information to be able to go to libopencm3 people and have a productive conversation. So I joined on to the IRC channel and started talking to them about my problems. And several people were very, very helpful indeed. And I particularly want to call out Vegard Stahl Eriksson. He had been working on aspects of the USB stack. So he was quite familiar with the nature of some of the things I was encountering. And I was able to send through screen screenshots showing the flow of control, the uh, path with which the failure was occurring, and he was able to help me figure out the exact cause of the error. So to understand the cause of the error, let's have another look at the trace we captured in pulse view. So on the left here, we have the outbound transaction, and then we have the fateful inbound transaction, and thereafter, the USB state machine of libopencm3, every single iteration, it goes into the stall transaction function. So what is the what exactly is going on here? And if we zoom in on the outbound transaction, we can see something that looks kind of reasonable. So we have a setup packet, and then we have the arguments of the control message being sent, and we have the hardware responding with an ACK. Uh, the microcontroller is happy to receive this, uh, this heading here. And then the PC tries to follow up by sending the outbound transfer's data payload and the microcontroller is not ready to receive this because USB pole has not been invoked in the interim and so the hardware automatically responds with a knack and this happens again and then eventually USBD pole gets invoked once more the packets the of the heading has been processed and so now the microcontroller is set up to be ready to receive uh, the data payload and so on the fourth time uh, the microcontroller responds with an acknowledgement so this transfer is actually accepted and so on uh, for the whole outbound transaction now, for whatever reason, when the uh, transaction finishes, uh, the microcontroller is still uh, in the state where it thinks it's handling an outbound transaction. And so along comes, uh, after a, uh, a few microseconds, this inbound setup transaction. So we set, it tries to set up the, um, uh, the arguments for the inbound transaction, and the microcontroller responds with an ACK. But of course, the software for uh, the libopencm3 USB stack still thinks it's in the outgoing mode. So actually, it should have responded with a NAC until it had actually finished processing the previous set of packets. And uh, thereafter, it all gets very confused because, yeah, the libopencm3 USB stack thinks it's in an outbound transaction and the PC is talking to it about an inbound transaction. And so it goes into the error state thereafter because uh, it's just thoroughly confused. Now, the reason this reared this ugly, its ugly head is that when the delay is short enough, USB po BD pole is called often enough, then due to the timing, it's not possible for the state machine to get confused in this way. So most uh, software would never, never fall into this trap. But if there's enough processing being done between calls to USB D pole, then this error can occur. So with this understanding of the issue, uh, Zip from the OpenCM3 project was able to produce some patches and these patches were included in the main line and they completely resolved all my problems. Well, that's just about it for this video. If you're interested in finding out more, check out the show notes and you'll find links to various things around the web and all the source code of everything I've covered here today. And I want to give a big, big shout out to my 10 Patreon subscribers and a couple of other individuals who've made major donations to the channel. I really appreciate the support. It makes a huge difference to what I'm doing here. And one of the things you may have noticed is that I've been working on my studio setup 
and so hopefully things are looking a little bit better for you and I've got a brand new camera and so I'm going to be presenting everything in 60 frames a second for you to enjoy and if you're supporting the channel that's something you've helped enable and I really appreciate it and if you think if you're thinking of supporting the channel there's also uh, Bitcoin if you'd like to donate via that method and for everyone if you like the video give it a thumbs up and subscribe and leave your comments down below I appreciate every comment I receive good bad questions feedback whatever it may be I appreciate all of it and so hopefully I'll see you next time on the open tech lab